Software engineer isn't the only career opportunity at tech companies. There are so many other roles that allow you to be as technical as you want. I won't be discussing people in sales or law or operations. Instead, I'll be breaking down the roles that require some technical knowledge. Or even if they don't require it, the most successful people in these roles are technical to some degree. After all, to partner with highly technical people, you have to speak their language and empathize with their needs. There are five main buckets, engineers, scientists, analysts, product managers, and designers. And a quick shout out to our friends at TestPro for making this video possible. We'll get to them in a bit. And for each bucket, we'll be going from most technical to least technical. Let's get into it. Part one, engineers. For the most part, you'll know who the engineers are because they'll say so in their title. I'm talking about infrastructure engineers, software engineers, sales engineers, and so on. Infrastructure engineers. I would say infra engineers are some of the most technical people out there. Not because they necessarily write the most code, but because they have to understand entire technical systems deeply. I mean, I can tell you how to write a singleton pattern or a function that mutates a list, but if you asked me how our code at Bolt is deployed, I wouldn't know. I mean, I've heard the buzzwords like Docker and Argo CD, but do I actually understand them? Absolutely not. But infra engineers do. In fact, it's most of their job. They work with cloud technologies like Azure and GCP and AWS, and they interface with tooling like Kubernetes, Argo CD, and Docker. I have so much respect for infra engineers because of how unbelievably frustrating their day-to-day -day work is. I mean, think about all the issues that arise when you try to compile your code and multiply that by a thousand, and you're not even close to understanding how hard it is to deploy and maintain whole technical systems. I'm just gonna go out and say it. You have to be a little crazy to be an infra engineer, but that's not a bad thing. It's admirable. As an infra engineer, you're probably working with config files and the terminal and some command line interface to a remote machine or the cloud. And if you're writing code, it's probably terrible. I think site reliability engineers or SREs also fall in this bucket, but their niche is more keeping systems up and running. It's like a subset of infrastructure engineering. Software engineers. It should come as no surprise that software engineers are at the top of the list, and I'm definitely not biased, but I'd say it's the best role. Software engineers are responsible for building products, technically. I mean, think of all the apps and websites you love, like Angry Birds or Twitter, and software engineers are front and center. And their job? Building. Depending on years of experience and interest, building can mean one of two different things. You're either architecting, thinking of system design and API contracts, or you're writing code to build the feature. Now, you're not just writing code and handing off the work. Usually you're involved in the full life cycle of the system, from the pre-development phase to actually writing the code to the rollout and making sure the metrics and dashboards all look good and everything is a success. Some of the common tools you use are the dev console in the browser, an IDE, the terminal, postman, and trusty old Google. This bucket comprises of everyone from product engineers to backend engineers, full stack engineers, front end engineers, and so on. The only difference is where you work on the stack and what you specialize in. You probably have the least number of meetings of any other roles we're gonna talk about, and trust me, that's a huge win. Data engineers. I think data engineers are like half software engineers and half infrastructure engineers, in that they write code, but they also work on data infrastructure and pipelines. Data engineers are responsible for data engineering. I mean, duh, it's in the name, but what does that mean? Well, collecting and storing data are extremely complicated problems, and don't even get me started on the nightmare that is cleaning data. Data engineers build full data pipelines to make the tasks I just mentioned really efficient in terms of speed and storage. A lot of this requires intricate knowledge of technologies like Spark, Hadoop, Airflow, and so on. And it's kind of weird, but I'd say you don't actually need to understand databases that well. I know it's confusing because the word data exists in data engineers and databases. Because in many ways, the database is too simple. That's why you have technologies like BigQuery or Redshift and other data warehouses. Data at scale is so much more complicated than just writing to a database. And even if you are thinking of databases, it's not Postgres, it's DynamoDB and Bigtable and other variants. I'd say machine learning engineers also fall in this bucket, but they work on the niche that is machine learning, so machine learning pipelines and models. And they A-B test a lot. They deploy various models and see which ones fit the data best. In this role, you're working with all the technologies I just mentioned, and if you're coding, it's probably in Python. And the environment? The magical thing known as Jupyter Notebooks. Testing or QA engineers. Testing is the backbone of every company, and if you're not testing well and often, you're setting yourself up for incidents and escalations. While every engineer I've mentioned above should be testing their own code, they're only testing it in a very specific way. They're unit testing, making sure their functions or features work as expected. 
but they're not thinking about end-to-end -end flows and how their logic fits in with existing logic. These end-to-end -end tests are called integration tests, and they're what the QA or testing engineers focus on, along with manual testing. After all, it's good to have someone inside the company constantly trying to break your systems, rather than some poor customer encountering a nasty bug in the wild. Testing engineers make sure the testing suites are automated, that there are no failures, and they monitor the staging and sandbox environments. If your code is getting deployed to production successfully, it's because the testing engineers are doing their job well, so thank them. There are many ways to start your journey to becoming a software tester. One great way is the ITQA bootcamp offered by TestPro. You might think a career in testing and QA requires deep coding knowledge, but you can learn most of the coding knowledge you'll ever need at the job. If coding isn't necessarily your passion, with only nine weeks of training, you can land a successful career in IT, and the salary started $70,000 for your first year. In just a few weeks, you can become a full-fledged IT specialist, and graduates of the TestPro Bootcamp work at companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Disney, and many others. Take your chance too and join TestPro's free webinar today at testpro.io slash June. Sales engineers. The last class of engineers we're going to talk about are support engineers, also known as integration engineers or sales engineers. And even though their work might differ slightly company to company, the high-level overview of their responsibilities is the same. These people might not be involved in the feature development lifecycle, but they take care of everything afterwards. And if you've ever worked in retail, you know how terrible people can be. Well, if you've ever worked with enterprise customers, you probably know how frustrating they can be too. Sales or support engineers are like the heroes we need but don't deserve, because they're the first line of defense. Support engineers help customers set up the services and products that they're already paying for. Like if you were a merchant and wanted to integrate with Bolt Checkout, you'd be assigned a dedicated integration engineer who'd help work with you on the integration and debug any problems. Integration engineers can also raise bugs and ask for feature requests. Another reason integration engineers need to be technical is because they're in the weeds of the problem, not just on the company side, but also on the customers. Like if you were integrating bulk checkout, you'd probably be using a platform like BigCommerce or WooCommerce or Magento 2. This is a very customer facing role. So you're probably using everything from ticketing software like Zendesk to the actual browser dev tools. Part two, scientists. If your company is very small, you probably don't have any scientists or researchers, unless you're very specialized, like a medtech startup or a hardware startup. But if you're somewhere big, you definitely invest in academics. And what do I mean by that? All that stuff I hated learning in school, like statistical theory and algorithms and whatnot. Data scientists. Though it's great to have a lot of people who can go out there and build stuff that's practical, it's also very powerful to have people who understand theory. Data scientists approach company problems from an academic perspective. They think about statistical theory and relationships between models and significance. They also make sure that the data samples are representative of the population and contain little to no bias. I'm not fully sure what tools data scientists use, probably R or some other statistical software, but they also use whiteboards and pens and paper. Once a team identifies what theoretical knowledge will best help the project, the data scientist works closely with the data engineers to test out the hypotheses. Research scientists. Big companies realize they can only continue to innovate with more advancements in technology. That's their competitive edge. Like when you think of Apple, you think of how revolutionary the iPhone was or the new M1 or M2 chips. And all of this came from science, from research. I mean, it's a huge technological feat to fit thousands of songs and internet capabilities on a device that fits in your palm. So think of all the research at universities and labs with PIs and take them out of that setting and put them at a big company with almost infinite resources, lots of funding and pay them boatloads of money and you'll get that innovation. If you love research and you wanna make a ton of money, being a research scientist at a big company might be the move. Be warned though, you'll probably need a PhD or at the very least a master's. Some of the most prestigious programs are FAIR at Facebook, the AI research or Microsoft research or all the awesome things they're doing at Google. I mean, the entire idea of Google came from Sergey and Larry's thesis on PageRank, their PhD thesis. Part three, analysts. The world runs on analytics, which can be simply defined as extrapolating key insights from data. Basically asking and answering the right questions. I mean, this is the entire premise of the movie Moneyball. Figuring out which players are worth it to put on the field and which ones are overvalued. Essentially trying to find the best bang for your buck players. Well, it's no different at a company. You're trying to find the best bang for your buck products. To understand a company's customers, which products are performing well and other key insights, data analysts, well, they play with the data. They write queries and create dashboards and analyze metrics to understand how a feature is doing. And more importantly, 
why it's doing what it's doing. These queries can be directly in SQL, like select something from something, but way more complicated. I'm talking joins on multiple tables and aggregate clauses and maybe even some imperative SQL. But there's also a lot of tooling that sits just above the SQL layer, like Metabase or Mode, so data analysts might also use them. Part four, product managers. Similar to data analysts, there's no list here. A product manager is a product manager. Sure, they might have become product managers by taking different paths. Like some come from a very business background. They start as a consultant or investment banking, then go to private equity, then go to business school and then transition to tech. Or you have people who do entry level programs like becoming a program manager at Microsoft or an APM or RPM at Facebook or Google. Or you just have people who are software engineers and then get interested in the business side and they become product managers. There's no wrong path, they're just different. Product managers are in charge of figuring out what the engineering team should go out and build. They go and talk to customers and understand what their pain points are, and then try to craft products that will fit those needs. They also prioritize, like of all the things we could build, why do we pick this one? Why do we do it first? And how much time will it take? They serve as the middlemen between the engineers and the customers, and make sure everyone is aligned on timelines and success criteria. They also monitor the rollout and decide what makes the launch successful. Are we gonna analyze retention metrics or engagement or adoption? Product managers don't have to be technical, but they have to understand technology and be able to pick up all the terms because after all, they're talking to highly technical teams. They're mostly using the same tools as data analysts or working closely with them to understand the data. And they're in a lot of meetings where they probably use the G Drive suite like Google Docs and Google Slides or Microsoft Office, so Word and PowerPoint. They also love OKRs and roadmaps. Part five, product designers. And last but not least, we have product designers who worry about what the feature is going to look like. Product managers decide what we're gonna build, engineers go and build them, and product designers decide what it's gonna look like, how it's gonna feel. There are two types of designers and they don't have to be technical at all. UI designers. User interface designers think about color palettes and fonts and how the thing is gonna look like. They care deeply about making beautiful products that delight. You don't need an arts or creative background, but it sure does help. Think about your favorite websites or apps and how beautiful they are. And I promise it's all thanks to the design team. UI designers work really closely with product managers and they usually use Figma or the Adobe suite. UX designers. User experience designers think about how products are used. Where's the navigation bar? Does it open vertically or horizontally? These are the types of questions they think about. They also think about accessibility to make sure features and apps work for everybody. They run focus groups and talk to customers and run experiments, watching closely how people use the things the company is building. They also use Figma in the Adobe suite and they love wireframing. We've just finished talking about the five types of roles at tech companies, everything from engineers to designers. And hopefully this video has shown you, you can be as technical as you wanna be. There's a role for you. That's all I have, till next time, cheers. Yeah.